So I will introduce communication about the interplay between sustainable development and the economy, or let's say economy and ecology in a whole. And uh, this communication is uh, fueled by works of my colleague Pierre Desrochers, who is not here today, who works in University of Toronto and published many papers about the um, spontaneous propensity of entrepreneurs to recycle wastes in Great Britain in the 19th century. And this will be the um, main, the, the, the main stuff this communication is based on in order to draw some uh, uh, insights, hopefully. So why do we have... So... Uh, <coughs> No what is it that you need to do? I want the other slide, following the slide. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. No yeah, okay, good. Mm -hmm. There's the keyboard as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm not used to that, I'm sorry. Huh? But I will manage, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Okay, so this concern for the interplay between market economy and sustainable development stems from this kind of statement which is quite commonplace in sustainable development papers and environmental economics, um, stating that in fact the market economy needs to be disciplined in order to entail ecological concern or sustainable or achieve sustainable development goals. And it should be corrected by political or cultural devices. Political here echoes public regulation and cultural echoes business ethics, corporate social responsibility and uh, so on. So this is quite a widespread belief. Of course, here is a mere quotation. I don't intend to derive any generalization from this kind of quotation, but it seems to be quite commonplace in the literature when you read papers uh, dedicated to this issue. So we are going, or we would like to challenge this kind of belief because this kind of belief is not only assumed by and large, it is quite often asserted. Many authors, many writers posit that market economy must be corrected or even sometimes you meet the word civilized by politics or ethics. And we would like to challenge this belief or this assertion by showing that, in fact, first, the theoretical background of sustainable development or environmental economics, I will make a confusion between both, should be challenged somehow. And then, by showing that in the 19th century, especially in Victorian England, entrepreneurs had a sort of spontaneous or largely spontaneous propensity to recycle waste. And by this time, CSR were, was not influential and public regulation was quite weak, in fact. And then we would, we would derive some insights and even avenues of research from these, uh, uh, from these insights. So, I will be very brief about the first point, which is much more developed in my paper, of course. But, I mean, when you read sustainable development papers or CSR paper, business ethics and so on, of course you have many visions of the market which are conveyed through these papers. So there's no one vision and there's a, a body of research, I mean, for an exegetic analysis of what it contains. But in one word, I would say that the mainstream sustainable development and environmental economics usually posit that environment is a source of externalization for businesses. Businesses spontaneously strive to externalize costs regarding everything which is uh, related to waste and environment. But aside from some radical points of view, I mean, which are very anti-market in a who, most writers, most authors acknowledge that market incentives like cap and trade policies and so on may be useful tools for uh, resulting in sustainable practi economic practices. But the third point is it can be the case only if uh, 
politics or ethics discipline the process and make the impetus of it. So that would be a challenge, but I will do it, I mean, at the end of the communication. A case, so I will work, I will present the case of uh, waste recycling in Victorian England in the 19th century. I will, of course, consider that recycling waste is a sustainable practice, quite ecological one, which is widely recognized and alleged. And then that Victorian England was an archetype of laissez-faire policy. It means that the free market was uh, uh, at work by this time. I mean, we can uh, consider it. So in the 19th century, many authors reported in this table, in fact, reported that waste recycling in all industries in the 19th century, especially in England, was business as usual by this time. And it has given rise to uh, an outstanding stream of uh, literature. These authors are among all those who have dealt with the topic. And the three first ones, Babbage, Playfer, and Abel Simmons, may be held as pioneers of this trend of research because they have uh, paid a lot of attention to this phenomenon of waste recycling, written a lot, even organized exhibits and uh, written papers and so on. So it has given birth to quite a, a, um, a large body of research. So what is interesting when you read this liter literature, Pierre Desrochers, my colleague, did it in fact, it is that it uh, stresses two major statements. First, uh, waste recycling was really business as usual. I mean, they report thousands of cases of byproducts have be having been developed on the basis of uh, wastes, costless, costly wastes. And it impacted every large industry in England by this time. So, it was so, in fact, commonplace, such an analyzed tendency of businesses to do so, that Marshall and even Karl Marx said that businesses have this spontaneous propensity to turn costly wastes into valuable byproducts. It means to turn, to turn the costly into the source of profit, which is quite a remarkable economic performance. And one author, an jour American journalist, wrote that, in fact, some fortunes have been built on this propensity to spontaneously recycle wastes. So this is a diagram, quite interesting, uh, made up by an author called Shelford. I don't know if it's very explicit, but I, it, is, it has been done without any software paint or in, in 1919. So, uh, it's just a drawing. So from a root made up with industrial wastes, it has given birth to many byproducts which, has, which have become a source of profit and even sometimes a matter of export for the industries, industries who develop that. For example, the coal tar, coal tar and gas tar was a nuisance considered by industrialists by this time of something really awful. I mean, it was killing aquatic life when dumped into river, destroying the vegetation when buried and polluting atmosphere when burned. And it has become the raw material of creosoting. I don't know if you see creosote, which is um, the creosote is a substance of timber which make I mean, it's quite technical because it has been made by engineers, which make timber more robust, more solid, and uh, allow the railroad and the telegraph industries to thrive. So coal tar, who was something, uh, a, a sort of an evil material, became a source of not only profit, but export for British industries. It has been exported, for example, for creosoting use, in the United States for fueling railroad and telegraph industries using wooden poles and uh, wooden sleepers. So this is one example among others of this uh, propensity to use waste and uh, to turn it into uh, a valuable byproduct. 
So these authors not only have described the propensity of entrepreneurs, but tried also to analyze it. Of course, there is a matter of discussion here. And some highlights are stressed in the various works of these authors, which are about four. First, of course, in Victorian England, the principle of parsimony was at work by this time. Waste not, want not was a sort of sentence incalculated to children at school and so on. So make the best use of scarce resources is also a full part of the spirit of capitalism as it has been stated by authors like Schumpeter and so on. An author like Peter Lud Simons or Rudolf Klemann insist on competitive pressures who entis businesses to make the best use of their wastes. Clement, for example, insisted on that in the state of harsh competition, it is really difficult to find or to uh, decrease outlays, to decrease expenses, and to diminish the cost of production, so that, in fact, entrepreneurs have a lot of incentives to try to use the words less and to turn it into a worthy product. But of course, laissez-faire economies, free markets, are not based on no rule. This is a commonplace belief which is absolutely wrong because market economies are rooted in property rights which are very civilly enforced and who were civilly enforced in the 19th century. Some authors have documented that and in fact many public regulations dedicated to public health, public discomfort, public safety were in fact granted in the preoccupation to make property rights effective because trespassing property of someone else is like vandalizing it. And uh, courts, uh, tribunals were very severe, especially in the early 19th century and condemned industrials uh, to injunction or to uh, uh, penalties when uh, some uh, individual pressed complaints against them. And then, also interesting, but a little peripheral for our uh, purpose today. This historical case brings in interesting insights about uh, transaction cost economics, I would say. Because some authors said that, in fact, recycling waste, first, was not always successful, of course. It was quite a risky and long odd process. But it was eased by industrial and institutional conditions, such as large quantities of waste, because it made worthy to find a best, a good use to this material when they were numerous, and when storage and elimination of them were costing a lot of money, of course. And then it was easier in large factories or in regions uh, uh, featured by business clusters, when a raw material of one industry could, uh, the waste, sorry, of one industry could become the raw material of the other. But I mean, it's eased by uh, a close communication between industrial working on about the same site. So this gives birth to a, a discussion, in fact, and one, an interesting thing is, why is there so often an anti-market prejudice in sustainable development literature? My opinion, it's open to discussion, is that it stems from a concept which is quite, in fact, challenged, which should be challenged, if not flawed, concept, which is the concept of market failure, stemming from a neoclassical, very narrow-minded conception of what a market is. In fact, most of discourses brought about the market um, devise it as a sort of a mechanic devoted to uh, make prices of commodities optimal, which is quite not really realistic because assumptions are very stark setting, quite narrow-minded, quite static. And in fact, it is even s funny, I would say, to notice that market failures, the concept of market failure, is derived from a school of thought which has the reputation to be a free market supporter, let's say the neoclassical one. So, if, I mean, under this vision, of course, the propensity of entrepreneurs to externalize short-term costs of a short-term perspective is uh, uh, prominent. But there is another 
uh, another conception of the market, much more realistic, dynamic and socially embedded, which is the Austrian one, which is not the mainstream one by our time, although it has been quite influential, influential at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, and which sees the market as a sort of process of coordination between individual stakes under the um, regime of uh, well-enforced property rights. So the case of spontaneous waste recycling suits well to this uh, Austrian conception of the market and it highlights two things which are really important. First, the key role played by entrepreneurs, of course, so it relates to entrepreneurship uh, theories who are agents of change and then the self-regulation properties of the market based on property rights. Rather than command and control regulations which are must in fashion by our times, in fact. So, it gives birth to a, a counterintuitive and even provocative question. I mean, if we can assess or ascertain that sustainable development is a relevant theme of research, which I consider is the case. What if, in fact, our world, our economies, or our societies were suffering of from not enough market rather than too much? That's a real question, and it's not so much uh, stressed, I mean, in the mainstream literature. So, I will propose, I mean, two streams, two avenues of research related to this idea that, in fact, we might suffer from not enough market rather than too much. And the first is that, the first is the most interesting regarding CSR literature. Some Austrian authors have stressed that in fact the industry in the 20th century was characterized, I mean the business, the head of businesses, was characterized by what has been called managerial omnipotence. This echoes works uh, of famous authors such as Galbraith or Bommel. Bommel said that managers were sales maximizing instead of profit maximizing. Sales maximizing behaviors and managerial omnipotence may be echo unfriendly because it leads to overconsumption of resources and uh, to uh, not fitting with the principle of a parsimony which uh, features the ancient uh, capitalism. And it also gives rise to another question. I mean, is CSR, isn't CSR a plea for a sort of a back of managerial omnipotence? I let that open to discussion because, of course, I let it at a provocative, provocative stage, but I think it would merit more attention than it is now. The second is more indirect, in fact. I wonder if the market is, is not sometimes charged for backups which stem from public economic policies such as booming ones, uh, from Keynesian inspiration, lowering interest rates, or um, assuming fiscal deficits, which also lead to overconsumption of resorts and lowering, artificial lowering of uh, the cost of capital. And these are probably eco-unfriendly in the way that they break with ancient capitalist and parsimonious principles. So, a conclusion, I hope I'm in the time. Just. Just, it's a good, good thing. So, of course, I will mitigate my, my discourse. So, first, let's not forget that it is a case study only. And uh, uh, it opens a discussion, but I mean, it doesn't aim at giving a demonstration that the market would be a sort of universal panacea for environment. The second thing is that, of course, let's have in mind that the market process was a sort of problem-solving process. Coal tar, iron slag, livestock waste, and so on were really damaging the environment at the beginning of the 19th century. And many individuals were complaining against this kind of pollution. So it, it is obviously not to say that market doesn't, or productive activities rather than market, productive activities doesn't, don't have impact over the environment. That would be absurd. But the market have self-regulation properties which over the long run help solving the problem when not hampered by, let's say, sometimes regulations or any, uh, 
any, any kind of devices of a political and maybe cultural nature of this kind. And the last thing is that I'm sometimes annoyed by the fact that ethics should be a sort of a, uh, a sexy uh, uh, theme that we would highlight or stress because ethics would have more self-regulation or regulation properties than the system of prices, of property rights, of a competition. And this is something I doubt very much about. Because in fact, ethics is uh, something, or regulation, it is something which is full of perverse backups and which, which can hide much more than what it says. So I think it's okay. So we have